Hello, my name is Robin Mitchell and welcome to EFM Electronics for Makers. In this episode, we're going to be looking at another Mitchell Electronics kit, the Logic Probe. We're going to see how it works, why it works and what you can do with it. Now when it comes to debugging circuits, it can be a tad tricky trying to figure out what logic signals are doing. You could use an oscilloscope, in actual fact that would be one of the ideal tools, that and a, a logic analyzer, which allows you to analyze logic signals over a very small period of time. But these can be very expensive. For example, an oscilloscope can cost you five, six hundred pounds, ones that gives you up to anywhere between two and four channels. But sometimes what you really need is just a simple quick tool to know if something's on, off, oscillating or floating. And this is exactly what the Logic Pro from Mitch Electronics does. So the Logic Pro consists of two main sub circuits, the first one being a simple inverter configuration here, and then two other inverters here. Well, I say they're inverters, they are uh, actually NOR gates, but most of them have been, have been configured to be an inverter with the exception of U1B. Now the input comes into this NOR gate here, which has been configured as a NOT gate. So we're gonna go and draw it like so. And you'll see there is a 2.2 mega ohm resistor going across like so. That's your input and there's your output. Now what this is doing is quite interesting. If the input is connected to absolutely nothing, this 2.2 mega ohm resistor acts as a feedback resistor and causes the output to oscillate. Only a very small oscillation and would be very hard to actually record it on an oscilloscope if you had like the old fashioned ones. On a digital one or a more precision one, you would be able to see this, but on a typical one, you would, you know, you, you would, you'd, it's hard to measure because of the magical stuff anyway. Now, so if the input is floating, the output has a tiny little oscillation. If the input is connected to zero volts, which would be a zero, a logical zero, the output would be high. Yeah, that's your typical zero, that's your high. Let's just draw this as a natural graph. So that'd be a zero volts there. That'd be a five volts, like that. And if the input was five volts or logical high, doesn't really matter, it could be five volts, three volts, then you'll get zero. And if the input was oscillating, which means it's doing this between zero and one, then the output also has a big oscillation. Now it's important to realize that this is a big oscillation between the maximum voltage of, this, of the circuit and the minimum voltage, P and zero, but the tiny oscillation isn't. It oscillates around the midpoint of the voltage like that. So if this was zero volts down here, and that was V down there, this would be about VC, it'd be about V divided by two. So it's gonna be like, let's say if we power the Logic Pro with a nine volt battery, it's gonna oscillate about 4.5 volts. It's a very, very tiny, tiny oscillation. Now, depending on the output, these two LEDs here, D2 and D3, will do whatever it is that they need to do. Now, depending on the output of this little inverter configuration, will either turn on or off these LEDs. If the input to this system is high, then the output becomes uh, low or essentially zero volts, which means that D2 turns on because current can go through VDD, through D2 and into the inverter configuration. If the output of this is high, that means that D2 turns off because you know current can't flow back into it, but current can flow out of that inverter, go through D3 into ground. So D2 turns on when the input is on and D3 turns on when the input is off. If the input is oscillating, then both of these diodes are going to turn on because for half the time, that one will be turned on and for the other half of the time, the other one will be turned on. But you must also understand that the brightness of D2 and D3, which represent uh, on and off respectively, also relate to the duty cycle such that 
The higher the duty cycle, where your incoming wave looks more like this, then D2 is going to be more bright than D3 because it spends more of its time being on than D3 and due to perspective, uh, oh, what's it called? It's the thing with the image of the eye. It's um, persistence of image or something. So this configuration allows us to see on, off and oscillating. But what about floating this tiny little oscillation? When this thing is floating, the output of the first inverter is going to be around the 4.5 volt range if it's powered by 9 volts, so half the supply. That means neither of these two LEDs can turn on. However, this tiny oscillation is enough to trigger this monostable circuit configuration here, which causes the output of this to also change. Now, the purpose of the monostable circuit here is twofold. The first one is to slow down oscillations. And this slows down fast oscillations to slower oscillations so that you can power an external LED. And the second purpose of this little monostable is to be able to detect the floating. Now, if a digital signal is oscillating, this configuration here can slow down that signal for displaying on the last LED. And the second purpose for this monostable is to detect the little floating oscillations here, such that when the input is floating and you get the tiny oscillation, it's not enough to turn on D2 and D3, but the monostable is sensitive enough to pick that up. And so when the input to the monostable is a tiny little signal like that, coming from the floating stage, that gets turned into a nice big changing slow signal, which causes D1 to turn on. So if we look at our LEDs, we have the red, yellow, and the green, and depending on their configuration, will mean different things. So if they're all off, well, you haven't powered your, your, your logic probe. If the red one is on and everything else is off, then what you've got is you've got a logical zero. That's gonna be the signal. If red is off, yellow is on, and green is off, then you've got a floating signal, high impedance. If only the green is on, then what you've got is a logical one. And if all three are on, then you've got an oscillating signal. And that is the Logic Pro. So now that we know how this works, let's build it. So as with any other electronics project, the first thing you're gonna do is check you've got all the parts and download the schematic and make sure it all matches up. So this is the kit you get from Mitch Electronics. It's in a foil bag. Uh, everything is uh, protected in uh, static wise, which is always good. Let's just go ahead and open that up and pull all the parts out. Make sure there's nothing left in the bag, that's fine. And that can be reused for something else actually in terms of keeping and storing components. So. Well, let's build it. The first thing I like to do always is the IC sockets. The reason why I tend to do IC sockets first and not resistors is because I like to, I like these to be put on absolutely immaculately. Nothing irritates me more than having a uh, IC socket that's slightly off. So what I like to do is I like to go ahead and solder the top right or top left pin and then the bottom pin. Like so. Come on. Well, there you go. And then from underneath, as you can see, because it's not actually on level at all, I like to put my finger here, like that, like that, and like that. And we have the thing perfectly flat, flat perfectly flat. Uh, I got this soldering iron actually from, um, di uh, I call it diddly D, uh, Lidl. Uh, if you don't get the reference, basically the diddly D joke is something from uh, Mitchell and Webb. Uh, long story short, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite funny to watch. Like you have to just, just Google diddly D, you, you'll see what I mean. Anyway, so from Lidl, see, I got the soldering iron from Lidl. It's actually a really good iron, but the tips are terrible. So I'm going to buy some new tips um, that don't have the screw type because these actually use a screw to fix in. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to thread that with an M4 thread so I can use a different type of tip that will essentially make your own tip for your soldering iron. So let's just quickly go through all of these and Get them soldered up. You'll notice the lack of an extractor fan. I'm not that picky. I don't do enough soldering to justify it, to be honest. So there we go. That's all done. Uh, the next part I'm going to do now are the resistors. So I'm going to do the first. The first thing I'm going to do the first three one k resistors first, and I believe those are. R5, R1, and R4, R5, R4, and R1. So just gonna stick those all in. Now, interestingly, 
most people tend to pull the pins outwards. I find that if you pull the pins inwards like so, you can actually fit quite a lot of resistors at the same time. Otherwise, otherwise if, you, if you bend them outwards, if you've got a resistor next to it, you can't do them both at the same time. I'm just going to go ahead and push that one through. Close that up. Turn that one. That's a humongous bee in the workshop, it's huge. I'm not going to move the camera, I'm just going to keep it there. That's what happens when you live in the countryside, you get flies, bees and seeds coming through the window all the time. Right, so now that's all done, I'm just going to go ahead and solder those up. The, uh, the fact that my tip is basically deteriorated makes it quite difficult to solder. But in all fairness, when the soldering iron does work, it does a really good job. I mean, I've set it like 450 degrees and set with Celsius, you know, and it, it does solder really well. The, the solder just sort of goes very, very liquidy and flows quite nicely like that, you see. So it just really does the job well. And it's not too harsh on the components, but you may want to turn it down if you're going to do something like a transistor. In all fairness, I've never actually damaged a part through heat. I mean, I've, I, I think it'd be hard. They always moan about putting heat sinks on transistors when you solder them, but I, I think I think you'd have to be very, very silly to actually be able to damage a... Um, yeah, you'd have to be very silly to damage a part by heat, I believe. Right, so now we're going to put on the 2.2 uh, mega ohm resistor, which is R3. This is the input resistor that um, forms our weak, uh, is it the weak oscillator? I think it's a weak oscillator, yeah. You'll notice that this time I've just done the, um, I just did the resistor legs going out because there are no other neighboring resistors. So if there was like loads of resistors on this board all packed together, I then push them in instead of out. And then the last one is the 4.7 mega ohm resistor. Stick that on. Let's get that in the middle of the camera. that the 4.7 mega ohm resistor is there we've got two capacitors both the same value so it doesn't matter which way you put them in because they are ceramic of equal value like so haha -ha, that one's in and then that one too And I keep knocking the sponge off. That's one of the criticisms of this soldering station is that the sponge that sits on a tiny metal plate is not even held in properly. Uh, I have ordered one of those brass sponges because I'm getting really irritated using the wet ones. And I mean, this thing is absolutely wrecked. This bit, I mean, absolutely wrecked. Practically impossible to use. I might have to change it for a chisel in a second, actually. Yeah, I'm gonna change it for a chisel. I can't even get a point in it now. Give that about 30 seconds to heat up because it's a new chisel bit. It's not going to be exactly perfect. It might make things a little difficult when trying to solder because it's, it's a flat chisel, so it's going to get in the way a little bit. All right, I think that's had enough time. Let's go ahead and tin this thing for the first time. Oh, wow, it's changed color really fast. Right, okay, then. Let's see if we can... Yeah, that's really, like, phobic. That's not good. Hang on. Let's just try soldering it. Oh wow, that's done a really good job. Okay, let's flip this around. Yeah, that's really good. I should use a, uh, a holder for this, but I can't be bothered to get one. Plus I find it a bit irritating and I'm constantly have to take it off the stand all the time. I mean, I don't, I know this soldering job's probably one of the worst ones I may have done. Plus I'd never really do this in front of a camera, so. So that's that part done. I'm gonna go ahead and put the LEDs in. So you've got the on, which is the 
ci sarà qui che no Oh, it's just the omnid yet. So that green is now in. We've got the yellow, which is the oscillating. It's actually technically floating yellow. Oscillating is when they're all on. And then red, which is off. Like that. Looking pretty good. Go ahead and just uh, solder these up. This is a classic example of why a very hot iron can be very beneficial. Even though very high temperatures can potentially damage components, the, the solder just becomes so liquid and it, it it's very much adheres to anything. So it's definitely worth the risk. Yeah, mine's definitely set to probably more than 450 actually in Celsius. Yeah, I know it's very hot, but um. Oh, it definitely does the job. Yeah, that's done the job very well. Now the last part to add, what we're gonna add is the uh, pogo pin. And you might be wondering why this board has a pogo pin instead of just a, um, a solid piece of metal. One of the nice things about a pogo pin is that it can basically take the mechanical stress off, a connect, off the uh, connection here. So this is gonna be soldered directly to this pad here. Now if this was just a solid pin, and you push into something, it can basically just break it and you know, uh, cause fractures in the solder. So using a pogo pin means that when you push in, it actually puts, takes the stress and puts it into the spring. So it takes the stress off the joints um, and essentially dramatically increases the, the length of life of this thing. So the first thing we're gonna do, it's gonna be a little complicated. We're gonna hold this down with this thing here. And we're gonna tin this pad. Yeah, we're gonna have to definitely hold that properly. Yeah, that's good, okay, that's good. Yeah. As you can see, the pad, there we go. Once the pad gets the solder, it, you know, it goes onto it straight away. I'm gonna go ahead and solder the end of the pogo pin. Now these pogo pins are gold plated, so they should be very much wanting, yeah, exactly, wanting to have solder on them. Then we're gonna hold the pogo pin very quickly, uh, melt this pad first. I think that did not quite work. There we go. Beautiful. Make sure that the pin is straight as well. Now that pin's going to get very hot very quickly. We're not careful. Oh, there's a new use for the chisel bit. I'm just going to keep it in place. Moving the leg. There we go. Now it might be angled this way, but oh no, that's actually really good. Oh, very great. That's really good. Now the last stage is to put the wires on, but I'm not going to bother with that just for now. I just wanted to sort of see how this would go together. And uh, we can go ahead and take the chip off and put it into our chip holder. Now the way I like to put chips in, I like to put them flat like this and bend them forward ever so slightly because chips, when they're brand new, this, this is actually one way you can tell a chip is brand new and not a rip off or you know, not been pulled out from somewhere. The pins tend to be splayed outward slightly if it's been used, they'll be directly straight down like this one. So I bend them down straight so that they go into the um, into the socket better, like so. Just do that and that. We are all done with Logic Pro. Well, that's all we have time for today for this episode of EFM. Thank you for watching and see you next time.